Anyway, social movements are not inherently revolutionary. <coughs> Great American political theorist and historian Charles Tilley, writing in a way, trying to define what a social movement was in the middle of the 1990s, said that what movements try to do is to mobilize what he called wunk. And this four letters, new word, it's a U by the way, um, <laughs> worthiness, unity, numbers, and commitment. They seek to mobilize, in short, wunk, he put it, worthiness, unity, numbers and commitment, in order to do what? To persuade their rulers to act differently. That is what social movements do, he said. They seek to organize, show off, show how strong they are, to persuade their rulers to <coughs> conform more to their wishes. <clears throat> in other words, they engage, even in mass strikes, in what we might call militant petitioning. They engage in trying to get the rulers to change their habits. In other words, what he's saying is that bred into the very fabric of most social movements, most of the time, is reformism. They're not trying to change the world, they're trying to make, it, make the rulers behave better. <coughs> and the last thing that is important about the... Excuse me. about the present situation, or the, the modern situation, is that modern states are, in Gramsci's term, organic. That's to say that they are not separated entirely from society. Indeed, they are open to making concessions. They're open to influences from society. They're open to making concessions. They're open to modifying their structures. They're not, as Gramsci put it, not castle. I mean, the term caste has been revived, I see, recently by Podemos in Spain. Well, what characterizes capitalist classes generally is they're not caste-like. They, they're capable of making concessions. They, are, they encourage reformism, in a sense. The possibility of reform is always there. So you can see lots of forces within any kind of rising movement will seek to, dis to limit it and contain it to contain it within safe frameworks, within ch appropriate channels, and so on and so on. Having said that, you also have to say, because there is a wager, that the defeat of waves is also not inevitable. Because there are some people who write about waves as if inevitably they are like waves, they rise and they fall. Because firstly, movements are not homogeneous. Actually, they're fields of argument. Anybody who's ever participated in any kind of a movement knows that people, that one of the silliest things that's ever suggested about movements is that they should engage in consensus. They are just not fields of consensus. They're fields of argument. What people argue inside movements at particular moments and so on matters. It makes a difference to how they further develop. The key question which I think you have to ask about movements in our in our own period and in the future, is whether or not they begin to create new kinds of organizations from below. That begin, let me say begin, begin to challenge the established forms of power and established ways of doing things. Because it's in such settings, the forming of new forms of organization, new kinds of institutions, whether it's on the shop floor, or whether it's in the streets, or it's in neighborhoods, or whatever, it's there that people first gain experience and confidence in running things, and start, start to become, use Marx's phrase, fit to rule. That's to say they face the problems of actually running things, of testing their capacities, testing forms of organization, and this regularly ha it's not as if this is a peculiar idea, it regularly happens in big struggles. The in the miners' strike, the women of the pit villages had to rise to the question of organizing food. You might think, oh, that, that, you know, it's very interesting, but actually very significant indeed. They changed in the process, and they 
started with the organization of food and increasingly challenged demanding a role in the direction of the strike. They changed. They became more powerful. More... Their capacities developed. In the great strikes of 1980 in Gdansk that founded the Solidarity Union, the tram drivers first went on strike and then went back to work and started running the trams for free with posters all over saying, we want to help the working class. That's a new form of organization. That's beginning to take things over. Workers regularly have taken over plants. For example, the workers at ERT, the Greek TV station, took over when their place was closed initially. They took it over and carried on running it under their own control, under their democratic control until the riot police were sent in. Now they're back at work. Unfortunately, not because they marched back and took it, but because the Syriza government has given it to them. It would have been better from the point of view of the advance of the struggle if they'd done it themselves, but never mind. <laughs> People have taken over policing. They've taken over setting new norms of justice and so on in different struggles. And when people do this, and this particularly when such activities begin to be coordinated, then such organisations and institutions belonging to people, which they created themselves, become incredibly popular. And Trotsky writes about the Soviet in the early months after the February Revolution, that people ran to it to solve all their problems. They were the people were constantly banging on the door, demanding that the Soviet deal with their unpleasant husband, um, that they deal with a food problem, that the Soviet deal with things. And they, people trusted the Soviet in a way that they didn't trust anything else. There's a very interesting reverse story. In Poland, one of the reformist leaders of Solidarity in December 1980 complained that Solidarity was too popular. People were looking to Solidarity to arrest drunkards, he said, to solve all kinds of problems. And he said, that's a problem for us. Not, this is bloody marvelous. People really trust us. We can go further with this. But, on the contrary, we must contain it, and so on. The point about such new institutions is they can become, you always have to put the conditional, they can become the basis of a new vision of society. Now, there are two, then, two final things I want to mention with, before I come to my coda, or whatever it's called, the last bit. Um, the first is, there's a question. Is it the case that the beginnings of control over production and distribution begin to fall under workers' control? Because if not, then a, a revolution which is merely political and doesn't in fact deal directly with the economic questions will fail. The economic question becomes central. It isn't something to be dealt with afterwards. It has to be built into the fabric of what is going on. Does this happen or not? And if it happens, to what extent does it happen? Those are the sorts of questions you have to ask. And secondly, you have to ask, to what extent are new kinds of popular forms and institutions emerging, which are open in their form and transferable to other settings, in such a way that they offer a framework, for example, for opposing oppression? Or does the whole movement stall on such questions as sexism and racism and so on? Those are questions which arise. Now, is it possible that such ideas and practices might take hold today? And that's really, really where I want to end. Is there, I think there's a case for cautious optimism. I'm, I'm willing to cast my, put my money down for the bet. Um, for two reasons. One of which is fairly positive, although you may sneer at it. And the other is, uh, if we don't solve this problem, we're stuff stuffed anyway. The f positive thing is there have been going on over the last 20 years, largely without the Marxists being very interested, a whole wave of experimentations going on within, with democratic forms inside various kinds of opposition movements. Particularly, I mean, I think of things like the 15M, in 2011 in Spain, and the Occupy movement, and so on. But largely out in the autonomous field, there's been a lot of development, of discussion, and so on, of this kind. 
Sometimes it's been extremely daft, but the truth is that practices have been tested and amended. And there's a learning pro there are learning processes going on, and I think we should be paying attention to them, in more attention to them perhaps, than we have done. In things like the movements of the squares, in housing activism, and so on. That's one thing. In other words, the argument for a different kind of politics is not only coming from a few clapped out old Marxists. It's actually being revived. A, a, an argument for a different kind of politics, which is potentially revolutionary, is being generated in all sorts of settings that we ought to be better connected to. That's my first reason for cautious optimism. The second is that the trade union movement internationally has never not been in a worse state for, for a long time. But it is possible, and there are a few voices on the left who talk about trade unions seriously, it is possible to revive the trade union movement. And the only way in which it can be done is by challenging the existing way in which trade unions do business with their bureaucratic, top-down, divisive practices, <coughs> narrow practices. I mean, but it, that it is possible to win. You just have to read a book like Jay McAlevey's, like McAlevey's book, whose name I've forgotten. Um, somebody tell me. Raising Expectations and Raising Health. Raising Expectations and Raising Health. Or she's got a new book in the works. Because it is precisely the recovery of the trade union movement from its doldrums, which is the only, the only way in which it can be done, is through reorganizing the membership, turning the members into fighters, That's, that, that very process can recover a collective sense of class power. And that, of course, is absolutely central. Now, that's another area where it seems to me that uh, we've already been discussing those kinds of questions in RS21. I think we, that those kinds of discussions and learning from them and trying to do something about them are absolutely central. So, I would say that we have a long way to go, but it is actually possible to offer a revolutionary horizon. Thanks. Okay, in the spirit of trying to learn from some of the ways that people are doing meetings differently, um, and to give people an opportunity just to talk for a little bit after a long bit of discussion, um, we're just going to have two quick questions to discuss with people around you um, for five minutes and then general feedback um, from the floor. So, are people aware of this format? So I'll give a question and talk to the two or three or four people around you, however you wish to organise yourselves about this question. After five minutes, I'll stop you, um, give another question, five minutes to talk, and then we'll open it up for general discussion. Which, and if you don't want to discuss these questions, you can talk about something else, obviously. 